Good morning. Glad you're here today. Let's stand up and sing together too after we do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Pray that you'll be glorified. Thank you for all of the blessings of life and your grace that you extend daily. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome. We're going to stand on the promises.
Colin says this one's his favorite this morning. It's ancient words.
you take a Bible in hand and turn over to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. We're going to begin reading there. This is the annunciation, the announcement that Mary received uh, when Jesus was uh, be told to be born. And it seems like an odd topic to cover at this time of the year, but it goes along with what we've been reading in Quest 52. And uh, we'll look at that here in just a few moments. But let's pray as we get started today. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and you care for us. I pray, Father, as we consider what Mary was willing to do for you, Father, you ask us to follow you and do what you ask of us. It varies person to person with gifts and talents, but we thank you that you do call us to minister for you. I pray, Father, that your blessing be on your word this morning. We love and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Gospel of Luke chapter 1 beginning there at verse 26. It says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Do not be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus. He will be very great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestors, David, or his ancestor David, and he will reign over the house of Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, But how can this be? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. What's more, your relative, your relative Elizabeth has been pregnant in her old age. People, people used to say to her that she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. This morning we are going to be considering that question, can God use me for big things? And we're taken out of chapter 3 of Quest 52. If you've been doing your reading, this was the text this past week. Luke chapter 1 starting there at verse 26. On page 15 of Quest 52, Mark Moore wrote this, and I thought it was a great quote, and I think it's important to understand the topic that we're covering today. He said there, it matters whether our lives matter. The desire to leave a mark on the world is universal human longing. This is not arrogance. It's spiritual genetics. This impulse uh, for its significance comes from the creator himself. He wove it into our spiritual DNA. It drives the majority of of the decisions that we make. Today we're looking at the topic, that idea of purpose in life. And you see, purpose is so very important that it drives us, it gives us hope, it gives us purpose in life so that things that we do make a difference. They matter. And you see, Mary had been called to do just something rather phenomenal. Can you imagine God speaking to you and said, I want you to raise the Son of God in your home. Boy, what a big undertaking. But that's what God had called Mary to do. And you see, she knew what her purpose was at a very young age. 
Rick Warren wrote it this way, and I love this quote because it has to do with purpose in life. He said, without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. Without meaning, life has no significance or hope. The greatest tragedy is not death, but it is life without a purpose. Aren't you thankful today as you sit here that you know who God is? I know I'm, I am. I, I just praise God for that. I couldn't imagine going through this world without knowing who God is, and I know what God has called me to do. I don't mean me as a preacher. I don't mean that. But he's called me to live for his glory. I can't imagine just wandering through life not having any idea what purpose I have but God has called each and every single one of us that are here today and maybe watching on Facebook or YouTube or whatever, God has called us for his glory. He's called us for his purpose. Living through the ups and downs of life, we are called, every single one of us. And I hope that brings you encouragement. I hope that brings you a challenge. I hope that brings you hope. Because you see, we live in a world that doesn't have a lot of hope. But with God, we can. Now, one of the things that we see about Mary who we're going to focus on this morning is that God can use us despite our inadequacies. You and I, as we live life, we're quite frail. Look with me back in your Bible, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 29. Look how it describes Mary. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, and I can see why she was, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. You see, we're frail. We have our failings. Oftentimes we look at ourselves and we don't think we're very important or we don't think we're very much. But we serve a God that is very much, and he is incredible and powerful, and yet he chooses to use us. It points out here that Gabriel, uh, the archangel of God, the, the messenger of God, came to this woman named Mary. Well, what do we know about Mary as we look at her life? Well, most likely she was a teenager. That seems to be a common thought for the day. So she was just a young girl called upon to carry the Son of God, and raise him. Can you imagine? Most of us as parents, I remember back when our children were little, we would want to go out and we would ask somebody. I remember the very first time we ever asked anybody that was not family members to watch our kids. A teenager. Can you imagine? Entrusting the most precious thing you've got to a teenager. But here's God, the Heavenly Father, entrusting a teenager to raise his son. That's exactly what he had done. But Mary, as we look at her, she's not really someone of great uh, notice or anything of that nature. She's going to have a child that's not even the man that she's going to marry's son. It's going to be God's son. We know that. But she was betrothed to him. And the betrothal process, we touched on a couple of weeks ago in December. But it's a promise. A bride price is given. And there's a date set for a wedding in the future. And, And to be able to break that betrothal, to be able to break that, you had to go through a divorce. And that's what... Joseph was considering, but he chose not to. But here's the woman that is going to have a child that is not going to be the man that she's going to marry, and he is considering divorcing her or breaking the betrothal. This is Mary. Mary's really nothing all that incredible as you and I would probably look at at her. She never really did anything to change history as far as looking at her purpose or necessarily her role. She wasn't the daughter of a king, or she wasn't going to be queen, or she was not going to be a person of high, great importance of power. She was this young teenage girl that was from a little town called Nazareth that was a backwater, nothing very special. As you look at those things, you see something not all that impressive about her. She was going to marry a man, Joseph, who was just a day laborer, doesn't have a position of power or authority either. Matter of fact, when it mentions Nazareth, you guys probably remember back when Jesus is calling Nathanael into ministry, he said, come follow me. And before that, but Nathanael made this statement. He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? We'd understand that. That'd be like somebody saying, can anything good come out of Kitts Hill? 
Same thing. There's not a lot there. You've been there. It's a big, tall hill there, isn't it? Nazareth is not a whole lot different. It's not just a spot in the road. You had to be going there if you were, if you were going there. It isn't like you ran across it. But that was the question. Nazareth would hardly be, seem to be the place for the announcement of the Messiah, of not of just Israel, but of the entire world that will affect generations to come. That's where the announcement comes. And Gabriel looks at her and says, Oh, favored one, favored woman. And understand, Mary had not done anything to be favored, and she really wouldn't do anything later to be favored other than just the blessing of God on her life. Church, let me tell you something. You are favored of God today. You are blessed, not because of anything you've done in your past or not anything you're going to do in the future, but simply because God knows who you are and he loves you. You're favored. And Mary was no different. I don't know if y'all remember, well, I, I know you probably do. When, when we, I was a kid, I assume you did the same thing. You'd go and play with the neighborhood kids. We'd go out and play baseball or uh, 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 football or whatever it might be. And some of you probably remember this when you were younger, elementary age, maybe middle school. And you go out and you, you have 10, 12 guys or girls and you're going to play some football or basketball or, or baseball or whatever it was. And what do you generally do? You pick two captains. And the captains start picking teams. Do y'all remember those days, don't you? And they would pick, generally, if you were the captain, who would you pick? The worst player on the field, right? Nah. You'd pick the biggest, the strongest, the one that could move, the one that could throw, whatever it was. You'd pick the best first. And then the guy that was second or the girl that was second would pick the next best player. And you would go down the line. And you know where you didn't want to be picked, don't you? Yeah, last one on the field. Nobody wanted to be that position. And then they would look at the last person and say, well, you can have them. No, you can have them. I don't want them. Remember those days? But you see, God doesn't work that way. God doesn't necessarily pick the brightest and the best. He picks the ones that are willing. And that's important to understand. God will oftentimes use those that are willing, and it may not be the brightest and the best has more to do with attitude. The Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 28 says, My dear friends, remember what you were when God chose you. The people of this world didn't think that many of you were wise. Only a few of you were in places of power, and not many of you came from important families. But God chose the foolish things of this world to put the wise to shame. He chose the weak things of this world to put the powerful to shame. What the world thinks is worthless, useless, and nothing at all is what God has used to destroy what the world considers important. He's talking about us in the gospel, the amazing change that takes place in our lives as we understand as he's called us. And the game and the Angel Gabriel looks at Mary and says, you are highly favored. We wouldn't even look at her twice. But yet that's what God says about her. And God will often, often choose the ordinary, the common, the not so impressive to do the ex extraordinary, to do the thing that is different. That's the way things are. And the reality is this. What made a difference for Mary, what made her stand out, was willingness. And God can use us if we're willing as well. Skip on down to Luke chapter 1, verse 38. I love Mary's response. I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. She didn't understand it. She couldn't fathom what was ahead of her. No way possible. That's like me asking you, did you realize what ahead of you, what was ahead of you the day that you got married? No earthly idea. Do you realize what was ahead of you when you had that first child that was born into the world? You had no earthly idea what was ahead of you. You just knew you were in for a ride. Mary was no different. She had no idea what was ahead of her. But she said, you know what? I'm along for the ride, God. 
I'll do what you want me to do, and I will say what you want me to say, and I will follow you. Mary's introduction seems rather short. But wait, there's one that she's going to have that has this incredible introduction. Look with me there in verses 31 and 32 of Luke chapter 1. And look how Gabriel announces this Jesus that is coming into the world. I love this part. He says to Mary, he says, Mary, guess what? You're going to conceive birth and give to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus. Now, you and I, when we hear that name, we just stop and go, Jesus. There's no other name that's like that name. But you see, during Jesus' day, that wasn't an uncommon name. Uh, in the Hebrew, that name is Joshua. Some of you have heard, if you hear somebody else talk about it, they'll say Yeshua. But that's the Hebrew name, the Greek name, Jesus, goes back to that Old Testament. We oftentimes think of the book of Joshua and that leader of the nation, and it means Yahweh saves. And that's the name that you are to give this child. God saves. Isn't that interesting? Here's Jesus coming in the flesh, and he's going to be the one that saves. And then he goes on. He said, you're going to give birth to a son. Don't know how that's going to happen, she says, but she accepts it to be so. And it says, he will be great and called the son of who? Called it the son of the most high. That's literally the son of God. Now, we're called children of God, but this is the one and only begotten of God, the son of God. What an introduction. I imagine Mary's head was spinning as anybody's would be. And then it goes on. It says, the Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor. Who? David. Talking about a ruler. He's the greatest king that ever came out of Israel. He made the nation important. He is the one that set it apart from all the other nations, and he is known well, and he is the one that killed Goliath and ruled the nation. This is going to be one like him. I can imagine Mary was surprised. Talk about an introduction. And then it says there, and he will reign over the house of Israel, over Israel forever. His kingdom, this guy, this kingdom, it will never end. You and I can vote a president and after four years or maybe if they get two terms, they'll be out in eight years. But this king, this king will never go off the throne, church. He forever reigns. That is the son that Mary's going to have. You see, that's why that is so important to understand. And as I point out all those things, hear me, church, Mary was available and willing. That's why God could use her. That's why that was so important. You see, serving God will cost us something. I can't imagine the heartache Mary must have suffered. Can you imagine the early days, the ridicule, the whispers around the town of her having a child that wasn't Joseph's? That would have been talked about. And then as she goes through life, she treasured all these things about Jesus in her heart, and she knew the prophecies about him from the Old Testament, and she believed that he was the Christ, the Messiah. And can you imagine the heartache that she must have suffered standing or lying down at the foot of the cross looking up at her oldest son suffering and dying for everybody. And then from behind her, if she was on the front row, the insults that the people cast. Away. If you're so great, Jesus, come on down from the cross. Can you imagine what Mary wanted to yell out? But you see, sacrifice comes. With following God we can't miss that your willingness to follow God will cost you but it's unbelievable what God is willing to do Mary allowed God to work through her in such a powerful way that cost her like nothing else would but she knew what she was called to do and God can't use us for big things I want to conclude with this. Rubel Shelley was a preacher in the Church of Christ, and I love to, to, to hear him preach, or it, 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 just the sermons that he shared. And he gave this illustration one time that I thought was worthwhile. He said he pictured himself at the beach, 
group of children, young children, were there on the beach building a beautiful sandcastle, large. And the tide started to roll in. And he said it was fun to watch them. And they had their, their, their tongue out of their mouth, getting everything just right, making everything look beautiful. And then the waves started to kind of lap up. On them, And they started to get excited because before too long, the waves would just come and sweep over the sandcastle and wipe it out. He said, you'd think they'd be upset, but they weren't. They were gleeful and joyful and happy because they knew what was coming. They knew exactly where they were building their sandcastle and it wouldn't last. And he said, you know what? As adults, you'd think we would learn that same lesson, wouldn't you? This world is temporary. One day, every bit of it's going to be swept away, just like the sandcastle on the seashore. No different. The things that we value so greatly, our house, our cars, our bank accounts, all those things are going to be swept away. Not a thing is going to be left. But what does matter is what is eternal. What matters is what God has called us to do to live for his glory, to make a difference in other people's lives. You see, God created you, church, for a purpose, and it's for his glory. It gives your life purpose and meaning. Your destiny is not bound up in physical things, but spiritual. So living to be 100 is far less important than living well, even if for a short time. You see, God has called each of us for a purpose. Understand what that is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the example of this wonderful woman, Father, from Scripture, who was willing to be obedient, who was willing to do what you asked her to do, what you called her to do. Thank you, Father, for the Christ that's come into the world. He makes a difference in all of our lives. He is the Messiah. He is Christ. He is King. He is the Son of God. I pray, Father, as we move into a time of decision that you'll bless him. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me this morning, please? If you're here today and you're willing to come to Christ and you haven't, come forward. If you need to be immersed in your, into Christ, you can, we can take care of that today. Or maybe you have another decision to make. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe something's going on for you. We can pray for you as well. Let's sing together.
chapter 22 verse 19 the Bible says this and he took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me in Matthew and Mark this same quote of Jesus is limited to when he says this is my body. But here in Luke 22 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, the quote is, is, is said, this is my body given for you or this is my body for you. Why is there an important difference here when Luke adds given for you and Paul adds for you? Well, it's because by Jesus dying on the cross, it gives us the vicarious nature of the sacrifice of Jesus. In other words, he was our substitute. He's the one that paid the price that we should have paid. 
He's the one that went to the cross where we should have died. And so during this time, we reflect and remember upon, uh, upon Jesus that he really took our place. He was our substitute there at the cross. And we remember him now, and we return thanks to God our Father for the gift of his Son taking our place there upon the cross. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so very much for the gift of your one and only Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you so much that he was obedient to death and that he took our place there at the cross. And we know, Lord, that, that he died so that we could live. And so we thank you that we can remember him now as we take this bread and drink this cup to remember his body and his blood and that wonderful sacrifice that sets us free. And through Jesus that we pray, amen. Good morning. Um, I just have a few quick announcements for you. Um, 
for the youth. Um, one is our seniors, students, sweets, and spaghetti is coming up in two weeks. And you can look behind me, there's some pictures of um, some of the ones that we did in, I think, 2019 and 2020, um, just so you can see all the fun that we had. Um, if you would like to sign up, um, this is for seniors, like 60-ish and up or so, and also our youth. Um, and they will be serving dinner to um, the adults. We'll also have games, bingo, and spaghetti, and treats. Um, it should be a lot of fun. So if you would like to sign up for that, we would really like you to sign up either today or next Sunday so that we can get a good count and have that all ready to go by the 4th, which is a Saturday. It's going to be February 4th at 5 p.m. We also have transportation, too, if anyone would need transportation. Um, there's an insert in the bulletin today that you can fill out if you plan on coming, and you can just leave that at the table. There are chocolates at the table, too, so you can sign up and get a chocolate on your way out today. Um, so I just encourage you to come. The kids are excited to be able to get to know everybody and also to be able to serve you all as well. So we would love to have you participate um, in that fun evening. So that's coming up soon. And then um, this is for youth of all ages, by the way, five years all the way to high school. So um, some of the older kids can sign up too. All right. Um, and then we also have Superstart coming up. Um, if you would let me know today if your child plans to come to that, I just need to get everyone registered. That is the youth conference that's for fourth through eighth graders. Um, and that will be March 17th and 18th. So if you just let me know today if you're planning on coming, then I will get everyone signed up for that. So that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Taylor. Appreciate it. I ask y'all to please stand. Uh, Vicki, how's Gary doing? Is he doing better? He's doing better. Good, good. Uh, uh, Gary had knee surgery. He was having some issues afterwards, but improving. That's good to know then. Okay, good. Good, good. I hope so, too. I know that's a tough surgery. Anyway, it's been great to be with you today. Let's pray as we depart. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I pray that you be with those that are dealing with a lot going on right now. I pray for Gary. I pray for Junior as he's continued to heal up. I pray for others, Father, that have sickness going on in their home, their home and family. Thank you for your great blessing of uh, just watching over us. Help us to be your church and willing to serve you where you call us. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody.